Hey guys, welcome back. All right, we are still reviewing, yay. And in fact, we're reviewing unit two. So guys, that means we are still in period one. And I have already just spilt my coffee on myself. So yay for this beginning of this video. All right, so as I said, guys, this is the second in a sequence of nine different review videos for AP World History. So um, let's go ahead and jump right in. All right, so as I said, guys, we're still in period one, so we're still talking about the years 1200 to 1450. And as I've told you guys, what's kind of unique about period one in the context of AP World History is that College Board is more interested in sort of dropping you in the world and kind of letting you figure out what's going on. So I don't really have to go through and give you dates and times and really big events. Instead, I've got to kind of describe the culture. Um, I've got to, that's why, I, with unit one, we talk a lot about ge geographical regions, which is why I went through China and South Asia. Okay. Um, unit two sort of builds upon that. We drop you in the middle of Asia and let you kind of feel around and figure yourself out. Unit two specifically looks at um, how trade is important, specifically how trade slowly brings the world together. Right. Again, this is the whole story of AP world history is how trade brings us together as human beings. And in the context of AP world history, it kind of begins here in unit two, specifically with networks of exchange, AKA trading routes. So I'm gonna start class with giving you guys some dates. You already know these dates. Um, then we will jump right on into our review, okay? Everything on these slides is straight out of your unit guides, your curriculum. You need to know this and you need to be able to apply this on your multiple choice as well as your short answer questions and DBQ. So um, take good notes or add to your already good notes, ask good questions, and let's go ahead and get started. Couple quick dates to note. Again, you already have these written down in your planner somewhere. So that's very, very good. Um, the other thing I do wanna remind you guys is that May 21st, let me see, I think it's May 21st or May 20th, um, is when you guys are gonna have your AP World History exam. Why am I not working? Yeah, so it's gonna be May 20th at noon, okay? The day before your final day of sophomore year, which is awesome. All right, so I know, I know you guys keep seeing this chart, but I really, really think it's helpful, okay? Again, remember, period one is relatively easy. I haven't given you all that much information, but period one exists as a way to demonstrate change in continuity. When we drop you guys off here in period one, in unit one and unit two, Asia is the center of the universe, all right? The Silk Road, luxury goods, all of that stuff, all that really important trading goods, all the, the height of the world culture, it's gonna be in Asia, it's gonna be in China, it's gonna be in India, okay? And having gone through this course already, you know that over the course of period one, period two, period three, and specifically period four, the center of the universe changes. All right, as I said, we're gonna start center of the universe, period one, Asia, slowly begins to change in period two to the point where Europe is in the driver's seat in period three. And then Europe is slowly starting to kind of return um, power to Asia in period four, okay? So um, not as many questions come out of period one, but that does not mean it's not important. As I said, guys, if you're going to be writing contexts for DBQs, if you're going to know context for your questions, you got to be sure you understand every single one of these periods. So let's talk about networks of exchange. Okay. This unit, unit two has six different topics. So we're going to go through each one of these topics. Hopefully you guys remember some of them. All right. I think um, I didn't give you all that much information on the Silk Road and the Mongols. And that's not because they're not important. They're very, very important. But again, all you really need to know with period one is context. Okay. So let's get started. The Silk Road. Guys, when in doubt, somehow the Silk Road could fit into all of your answers. So, so, so very important. Okay, what the heck is the Silk Road? Well, it's a trading route. One of the many that we talk about in this class, in addition to the Indian Ocean trading route, the Trans-Saharan trading route, okay? 
the Silk Road is probably more important than even those, simply because you've got this movement, this road between China and Europe. Now, I know Europe's not really that important in period one, but um, the Silk Road is kind of the reason that eventually Europe's going to gain some notoriety. All right, Europe's going to get a little bit of taste of the good, the good life because of the, the movement of goods along this trading route. Okay. Silk Road's extremely, extremely important, guys. All right. The Silk Road exchanges expanded from previous time periods. So um, on that first slide, when we came in, that moving slide that I showed you, the Silk Road's been going on for a very long time. So when College Board drops us off in the middle of this world, we're already at the height of the Silk Road. Okay. The Silk Road is kind of a thing starting in about 200 BC. Um, people are trading goods. All right, they're slowly developing new trading networks. They're developing innovations that help trade increase. All right, people are starting to um, develop appetites for these luxury goods. So as a result of this expanded trade, you're gonna see the emergence of new cities, okay? So cities are going to kind of, um, kind of appear all over on these Silk Roads for traders to come in, to kind of keep their camels parked overnight. All right, for locals to trade um, luxury goods, okay? And so again, cities are gonna develop and that's a whole new thing, all right? Historically, um, when you look at humanity, humans aren't really living in big cities. They're living in rural countrysides. They're living on farms, but because of trade and because of the development of this appetite for luxury goods, people are starting to come together and live closer and closer. All right, as a way to make money because money makes the world go round, as you all know. So guys, luxury goods are really, really important. All right, if I gave you a DBQ about the Silk Road, being able to identify luxury goods, that's a good way to get the outside evidence point. So I know I harp a lot on these luxury goods, but I really want you to make sure you know them. All right, so we're gonna name that luxury good. All right, what luxury goods come from China? porcelain and silk. What luxury goods come from West Africa? Gold. Yes, gold. What luxury goods come from India? Textiles and spices. Perfect. What luxury goods come from Europe? Nothing. What luxury goods come from East Africa? Yeah, enslaved people, a little bit of gold. What luxury goods come from North Africa? Salt. Yes, salt. I know the stuff that you love to cover your French fries in. Salt's really, really important in these deserts to keep hydrated. All right, guys, so you know your luxury goods. You know what the kind of stuff that's going to be traded on the Silk Road. Now, as I said, guys, on the Silk Road, the most important things that are gonna be traded are indeed luxury goods. And we just went over what luxury goods um, are coming from what world regions, okay? Now, in order to facilitate this trade, you're gonna also start to see the development of in innovations that kind of make trade easier. You guys probably remember that we talked a lot about this thing right here, the caravanserae. This thing right here is a caravanserai. It kind of looks like a sandy box. A caravanserai is really, really important. It's basically like, like an early iteration motel, all right? So along these trading routes, caravanserais would appear basically a day's journey from the previous caravanserai. So if you're planning on going from point A to point F, you're gonna need to stay at places overnight. You know, you're gonna need to be able to buy water for your camels, all right? You're gonna need to be able to find a bed to sleep in. So from point A to point B to point C to point D, every night you'll be able to have access to these caravanserais, okay? And there are also nice little motels where you're gonna meet other traders and be able to kind of figure out what people are interested in, what things are good on, right? But innovations that in addition to caravan series, there's other innovations that gonna, are gonna be starting to proliferate, including banking, all right? You're not gonna wanna carry all your money with you. Um, the, the Silk Road, while it is relatively safe, there is the opportunity to get robbed. So you're gonna wanna keep your bank, your money safe in a bank somewhere. Um, credit, all right, credit's really, really important. 
if you're a trader and you show up in Beijing, China, and you want to buy a, a boatload of porcelain and silk, you probably don't have the money with you. So you're going to have to buy that stuff on credit. All right, this is all new stuff that's going to be created in order to facilitate trade. All right, remember, money makes the world go round. What, what else makes uh, the world go round is that suddenly people from around the world are developing appetites for luxury goods, okay? Men wanna buy their wives these beautiful silk shawls from China. They wanna buy their wives um, beautiful porcelain bowls, okay? Spices to spice them up, spice up the, uh, the delicious food. All right, textiles from India. All this stuff is going to be wanted, okay? Um, before I forget, iron is also a big commodity coming out of China. So make sure you guys know the combination of these innovations and this increased demand for these luxury goods, that's what's gonna make the world go round and round and round. Now, 2.2, okay, the Mongol Empire. The Mongols are super duper important. Now we have talked about a boatload of empires in this class. All right, I think we spent, I feel like we've spent half the year talking about the British Empire, the French Empire, the German Empire, lots of European empires and all that imperial crap that they did to Africa and the Middle East. But if you're looking at the timeline of um, AP World History, probably one of the most important empires and certainly one of the biggest and certainly one of the most violent, at least at first, is going to be the Mongols. All right, the Mongols, they are a group of nomadic people from sort of modern day Mongolia, which is right here, okay, sort of in East Asia. Now, the Mongols, as they're, they're nomadic, they don't have one specific land, all right, they live nomadically, they live in yurts, they move around throughout the year, they don't, they're not sedentary people. And eventually they start to conquer other groups of people, okay? Now this conquering process ain't gonna be pretty. All right, the, the Mongols are going to be led by this guy right here, Genghis Khan. All right, Genghis Khan, he's got a very interesting history. Depending on who you're at, you ask, he's viewed very positively or extremely negatively. Okay, now Genghis Khan is going to lead the Mongols to building the largest empire of all times. You can sit here and watch. Okay, but through this process of conquest, it's also extremely, extremely violent. As a way to kind of force people under his empire, he's going to commit lots of violence, um, murder, rape, all right? All on these, these local indigenous groups of people. It's a very, very violent process of conquest, okay? Hence why his reputation is kind of positive, but also negative, all right? Because of all the violence inflicted upon these societies, um, even today in 2021, I believe 0.5% of the world is his direct descendant, okay? So I think um, 16 million men around the world, um, and I'm sure some women, but it's harder to trace, are descendants of this guy right here. That is how prolifically violent he was in his processes of conquest. Now, eventually, and you can see when, if you're following this map, the Mongol Empire is going to break up, all right? Um, it's really, really hard to control an empire of this gigantic size. So Genghis Khan is going to kind of break up this empire into different khanates, and his grandsons will rule these different khanates. One of the most important ones, and I'll show you in the, the picture of the color, the purple right here, is going to be um, a dynasty that rules China, the Yuan dynasty, a.k.a the Mongols, okay? Um, that's gonna be ruled by his son or his grandson, Kublai Khan. Um, every single one of these regions will be ruled by a Khan. Um, I think the golden Khan is modern day Russia. Just know that while this is the largest empire of all time, it will eventually break up into smaller empires, okay? Now let's talk a little bit more about the Mongols. Even though the conquest itself was extraordinarily violent and resulted in the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people, as well as violence inflicted upon women, um, the Mongol Empire actually brought a lot of peace towards the end, towards, 
after everything had been um, conquered. So what the Mongols do is they, they practice a sort of a paganistic religion. So they're not um, Muslim, they're not Christian, they're not Jews. And, but what they do is when they conquer other places, they tend to adopt local religions. They tend to adopt the economies and trade systems of local religion or a local people. So again, um, the Mongols historically were, um, they were, you know, nomadic people. And once they had these empires and they sort of had to sort of settle down, instead of kind of creating new religions or creating new political systems, what they often did was just sort of adopt what they conquered. And that's really good, okay? Um, that's kind of the whole trend in this class with inclusivity and tolerance, all right? Now, once the Mongols are in charge, all right, you have this long system of the Silk Road now under control over one group of people. And that's gonna be the high point of the Silk Road exchanges. When one group of people completely controls the entire trading route, that's a good thing, okay? What that is going to mean is that um, it's going, you're going to see increased trade, specifically safe trade. All right, you're going to see a significant transfer of ideas. So people will be bringing not only luxury goods on the Silk Road, but religion and philosophy, okay? Um, culture, technology is going to be traded along the Silk Road as well, all right? People are going to have access to compasses, paper, astrolabes, new types of ship designs. All right, the Silk Road is not only just going to be for luxury goods, but it's going to be for all of this stuff. And because the Mongols have completely control over the Silk Road, it's going to be extremely safe and prosper prosperous. Okay. Now I wanted you guys to see the height of the Mongol Empire, just how big this place is. Okay. Huge, absolutely huge. All right, you still got Europe. You still got a little bit of the Song Dynasty left, but not for much longer. But the Mongol Dynasty is enormous. Now, in addition to the Silk Road, we also have the Indian Ocean trading routes. Now, the innovations you see in the pictures are kind of cool. All right, this is the astrolabe. I've never really understood what an astrolabe is, but I recently figured out that when you have an astrolabe in your hand, you can figure out where you are by kind of using the sun to know exactly where you are on the earth. Um, really, really important. Or at least where you are in the context of where the equator is. All right, the compass. Um, you can see in this picture, this is a Chinese compass. The compass was actually created earlier than even period one, but it's because of those Silk Road exchanges, more and more people are gonna have access to these um, innovations that you know make trade more and more um, easy to do, okay? So increased technologies and transportation are going to lead to more and more exchanges along these trading routes, and they're going to promote the growth of new trade cities. So let's think about these new trade cities. Okay, all those East African city states are going to um, owe their existence to these new technological innovations because people are now sailing the Indian Ocean um, across the water, kind of you know moving into Africa moving back into India, all around Asia, um, you're going to see the, the powerful new cities will emerge. Um, and these cities will be pretty free. They'll be um, open and access to trade. All right. There's not like a whole monopoly of East, Af East African city states or anything. Each city state's going to be the kind of their own thing. You're also going to see the growth of interregional trade. Okay. Interregional trade is between regions. So Chinese people are not just trading in China. Indian people are not just trading in modern day India. Instead, people are leaving their countries on these Silk Road, Indian Ocean, Trans-Saharan trading routes. And um, they're using these new technological innovations. They're using the compasses. They're using bigger ships designs, okay? They're using the astrolabe. And they're able to travel further and further distances in an effort to make money. All right, money's making the world go round, guys. Now, um, we talked a lot in August about this thing right here, diasporic communities. Now, because people are, you know, now they're able to go further and further distances. Um, they're able to, you know, you might be a, a trader from India, 
but you know, you might want to be someone who's in charge of trade over in one of these East African city states. So you get on a ship and you move to these East African city states. And what you're going to start to see within these major cities is the creation of diasporic communities. Okay. Um, a diasporic community is very similar to what we talked about in period three as an ethnic enclave, kind of like Chinatown, kind of like Koreatown, Japantown, but um, period one version of it. So what you're going to start to see, especially in these, these major cities, is groups of people from different world regions who are living there. But because these people speak a different language or practice a different religion, they often are going to live um, in communities amongst other people just like them. So in places like Kilwa, you'll see groups of Indians from, from India who practice Hinduism and speak Hindi, okay? In China, you're gonna see groups of Europeans, Italians speaking Italian and practicing Catholicism, all right? You're gonna see people in Calcutta, India um, who are originally from Africa, speaking indigenous African languages and practicing um, syncretic religions, okay? So diasporic communities are very, very important. They bring different cultural components, different types of food, different religions, all right? It kind of brings this new vibrance to these cities. And of course, you're gonna see major transfers of technology. Because of the compass, because of the astrolabe, because of these new ship types, people are traveling all over the world and spreading ideas and spreading religion and culture. Um, and you're going to see groups of people moving about, living in diasporic communities. Um, one of the Indian Ocean exchanges that we, we talk about in two separate periods is the voyages of Zheng He, all right, the eunuch from China who had the opportunity to explore the Indian Ocean Basin and, um, you know, brought all this amazing stuff back to China. Okay. Now we said it doesn't exactly have a happy ending because the emperor in China, um, the Ming di dynasty shut down these voyages and sort of paved the way for Europe. But the voyages of Zheng He actually give you the opportunity to really understand um, how vibrant this, this trading route really is. Okay. And on top of that, guys, what you're going to start to see is this new environmental knowledge. Um, once you have people who are constantly moving um, between lands, selling things, you're also going to have to have an understanding of um, environmental patterns, specifically in the Indian Ocean, the understanding of the monsoon winds. Okay, so the monsoon occurs twice a year. Um, basically, it's wind patterns. So between April and September, the wind is going to push kind of north. So if you're a trader in East Africa, you want to be part of this monsoon that pushes you up to India. All right, then you're going to have to wait until November to get pushed back down when the monsoon winds shift. Now, there is another trading route that we talked about, the Trans-Saharan trading route. Okay, the Trans-Saharan trading route is pretty much between um, northern and western Africa. So if you look at a map of Africa, I wish I had one, um, I could show you, but, well, let's see. No, that's not a good enough map. Um, Basically, you can go from the Middle East, Northern Africa, and Western Africa. It's a giant desert, extremely hot, um, extremely difficult to traverse, but we figure out a way to do it. And so you're going to see a growth of interregional trade, um, which is encouraged by these innovations that I've been harping on. All right, compasses. You don't need an astrolabe for this one, but um, the camel saddle is going to be huge. I, I know that doesn't really sound like that big of an innovation, but you know how hard it is to sit on a camel if you don't have some sort of cushion? It is awful. It hurts like heck. Um, so the creation of a camel saddle is going to allow you to sit for longer times. And you're going to be able to put luxury goods on these camels as well. All right. Caravans. So groups of camels or groups of animals that can move large distances. Um, this is going to expedite this trading process. Okay, and again, technology and commercial practices will lead to increased volume and in trade. Again, you guys need to make sure you know um, that the, the Trans-Saharan trading route, this is, this is a, a big movement of luxury goods, especially between North Africa and West Africa. So gold from West Africa is going to North Africa. North Africans are sending salt back. I know it doesn't really sound like a fair trade, but it is what it is. 
And speaking of gold, because of the Trans-Saharan trading route, you're going to start to see the proliferation of new empires, specifically one. Um, I told you all about the Mali Empire, or this purple region right here. And you can, you can see this is a great map, shows you all the kinds of stuff that's going to be traded. All right, um, I do need you to understand that the Mali Empire has nothing to do with the transatlantic slave trade. That's a period two thing. Um, I have a lot of students that get mixed up by that. Um, Mali is most famous for the amount of gold that will be mined and sold, okay? Um, the gold in Mali will be owned by the emperor. And you guys might remember, I told you all about Mansa Musa, the wealthiest guy in history, okay? Um, Mansa Musa will live here in the capital of Timbuktu and every ounce of gold that is mined will be his personal stash that he trades. So this dude's gonna be rich. All right, the richest guy in history adjusted for inflation. Now, of course, like everything in this class, there are consequences, good and bad, okay? One of the consequences is um, between this trade in culture, religion, technology, will be how things change, okay? What you're gonna start to see with this consequence of connect connectivity, how all these regions are now connected, is a diffusion of literature, all right? People are gonna be exchanging books, um, knowledge, art, culture, science, religion, and of course, technologies. One thing you're gonna see that's really, really important that will spread is Buddhism. And I talked a little bit about that in unit one. Buddhism is a native religion from India and um, Mahayana Buddhism is going to spread into China, okay? And once it gets into China, Buddhism is going to change to adapt to Chinese culture. So again, the easiest way for me to explain that to you is the difference between the Buddhas. If you go into an Indian restaurant, you're gonna see a tall, um, you know, dapper fellow who is Buddha. But if you go into a Chinese restaurant, he's gonna be a fat fellow where you rub his tummy. That is one way that you have these cultural changes, okay? You're also gonna see the spread of paper. Paper is something that is created in China. And because it's so helpful, because it's so useful, and because China isn't in charge of these trading routes, you're gonna see paper spread throughout the world. Now, I know there's a lot of words. Make sure you have them written down, guys. This is super important. One of the other consequences of this, this new proliferation in trade, um, this new connectivity, is cities. Guys, cities, as I said, um, they kind of are, they become really important. They spring up all over along the Silk Road. They become places where traders can come and stay in the caravanserai, um, trade knowledge and understanding of the world around them. They're important and they're good. But during this time, you're also going to see kind of declines in these cities. Um, one of the re reasons is just because this increased productivity means bigger and better cities. But when trade starts to fall off, the cities also start to decline. What might cause a decline in cities? Well, disease. All right, the bubonic plague will eventually make its way throughout Europe. In fact, um, I believe the bubonic plague is actually spread by the Mongols. Um, and once, once the bubonic plague hits some of these cities because of the increased um, closeness of people, that's going to really destroy the population of some of these cities. Also the Mongol invasions, all right? When the Mongols come in, they sort of destroy these cities as a way to kind of tame these indigenous cultures. Um, so you're gonna see a lot of these important trading route cities, once they get conquered by the Mongols, they're going to decline in population. However, one consequence is that the Mongols are pretty good. And so um, once the Mongols have sort of tamed all of Asia, we're gonna see a time period called the Pax Mongolica. Pax means peace, all right? The peace of the Mongolians. And what I said, guys, is because the Mongols are going to um, basically do such a good job in um, taming this world region and kind of keeping all these trading routes underneath their power, they are going to um, kind of give this long period of peace, all right? Um, and so you're going to see this, the development of cities again, all right? After the wreckage that they cause in these trading cities, the cities will come back. 
urbanization will come back and that is because these cities will be protected by Genghis Khan and the remaining um, components of the Mongol Empire. Now, you guys might not remember these two fellows, but um, you know, we don't do a lot of names in this class. If I give you a name, it's probably important. Um, I gave you the name Genghis Khan today, important. Now I'm asking you guys to memorize these two names as well. All right, they're gonna be, because of this new connectivity in the rest of the world, because people are trading, um, because people are making money, and because cultures, religions, languages are spreading, um, you're also going to see world travelers. All right. A guy named Ibn Battuta. He is a Muslim. All right. I believe he's from, I forget where he's from, actually. He is going to just basically travel all over the world and he's going to visit diasporic communities of Muslims all around the world. Um, he's almost more interesting than Marco Polo. I might remember his name if I were you because I've seen a lot of his writing being used in DBQs. Um, they'll take his um, information and they'll give you a document straight out of his writing, okay? Marco Polo is another one, except I know most of you all think about Marco Polo in terms of going to a local swimming pool. Really important um, traveler. Why is he important? Well, he's actually a European. And as we said, in period one, Europeans aren't really that special or that important. Um, Marco Polo is going to be one of the guys that goes back to Europe and really tries to bring to importance how um, trade really has changed the world. So Marco Polo's travels, as you can see, he kind of goes all over as well. So these world travelers will kind of help this whole trading process. Now, I've probably shown you this um, graphic I really, really like these graphics made by this guy, Freeman Pedia. He is also an AP World teacher. This is the environmental consequences of con connectivity. All right, so this is before the Columbian Exchange, guys. Remember, at this point in the world, the new world doesn't exist yet, but that doesn't mean that new um, crops aren't gonna spread. In fact, what you're gonna start seeing is spread crops will spread very, very rapidly on these trading routes. All right, bananas, which come from Southeast Asia, will slowly start to spread um, around Africa, okay? I think I told you guys about how oranges make their way um, from, you know, Southeast Asia all the way up to Spain because of Muslim merchants, and then eventually will we'll cross the pond into the New World, which is why Florida oranges. All right, coffee, another really, really important thing that's going to come from Southeast Asia. Sugar. And of course, champa rice, which we've talked about so dang much. All right, champa rice will come from Vietnam and it will come into China. Remember, that will yield two yields of rice each year, which will allow the Chinese population to really proliferate. But again, causes and consequences. New crop spread, that's a good thing, right? You want to have access to new foods. That's going to help our diets get better. But again, the sort of connectivity of people is also going to give the opportunity to spread diseases. And one of the most important diseases in world history, um, I guess you could call it a pandemic, even though it doesn't hit the new world. Now nah, go ahead and call it an epidemic, um, is gonna be the bubonic plague. And this is gonna be spread around along these trading routes. We don't really know where it originally comes from, although most people think it probably starts somewhere in Southeast Asia and it will spread into China, which will eventually spread all the way into Europe. And um, the story of the bubonic plague in Europe is a sad one. In fact, a third of the population will eventually die of this disgusting, horrible disease. So connectivity and trading, good, but with consequences, okay? All right, guys, we are done with our unit two um, review. Congrats, you did great as usual. Sorry, this is a great meme. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna say it. I came up with a good one. Um, email me if you miss class so I can let you know what your in-class work is and uh, have a great rest of your day and I will see you guys soon.